I've really already introduced myself, so I don't think I need to do it again. Um, but I will say that uh, the, the, the part that I played in, in the catalog besides um, organizing the exhibition and, and editing the catalog was uh, to write an essay on uh, Miro's involvement with ceramics, which um, is, something, is an aspect of his work that is, that is not very well known, like many of these artists. Um, but that uh, played a very important role. Um, you know, Miro made over 440 ceramics throughout his career over a span of about 40 years. Um, and so one can hardly say that it was a, a kind of a sideline or, or an insignificant dalliance um, uh, from, uh, that uh, doesn't uh, compare in any significant way to uh, his painting or his sculpture. And in fact, what he was doing in ceramics is intimately linked to what he was doing in sculpture as well. Um, I think we're almost there. We'll start, we'll start with a picture of Miro from 1934. There he is. Um, so Miro didn't actually take up ceramics until uh, right at the end of World War II. Um, and the previous decade had been an incredibly tumultuous, tumultuous time for Miro. He had uh, been in Paris for um, uh, most of the, uh, for over a decade in the 1920s, and then returned to Bar his native Barcelona in 1932, uh, but was forced to flee at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War in 1936. Um, from 1936 until 1942, he was, um, he moved from place to place in Paris being um, chased around, uh, uh, in France, being chased around the country um, by uh, various German bombing campaigns and eventually had to uh, uh, sneak back into Spain in 1940 because of, uh, he was persona non grata to um, the uh, military junta that had taken over Spain during the Spanish Civil War for his involvement in uh, the Spanish Pavilion in the 1937 Paris World's Fair, where he um, uh, created an enormous mural uh, that you, you see him painting on the right um, that was titled The Reaper, uh, Catalan Peasant in Revolt, um, and also produced um, a, um, a, uh, a print to uh, raise money and support for the Spanish Republic during the Spanish Civil War. Um, when Miro returned to Spain uh, in 1942, he uh, was forced to go to Mallorca where his wife's family lived um, and to essentially hide out. Um, I'm sorry, he returned in 1940 and in 1941, he was to have his first major um, solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York all of the correspondence uh, about the exhibition with the museum was written by his wife um, for fear that uh, he would, his presence would be alerted to uh, the military junta. And, uh, um, uh, and it wasn't until 1942 that he eventually felt safe enough to return to Barcelona and uh, start working again. Um, in, in as far back as 1938, Miro um, was starting to think about moving away from painting. Um, he, had, um, he had been involved almost exclusively in painting uh, for the majority of his career, and uh, with the exception of, of a few handfuls of uh, surrealist assemblages in the 1930s. And his desire to move away from painting I think was also uh, part of a desire to settle down. In 1938, he wrote an article uh, for the French periodical uh, Vantiem Siècle called I Dream of a Large Studio. Um, and you can imagine that in 1938, after having uh, moved to Spain um, and then being forced out of Spain again and then kind of uh, bopping from one temporary uh, studio and home to the next in France, he, he was clearly longing to uh, be settled and, and establish some roots, and really uh, engage in the ideas that had been filling notebooks upon notebooks upon notebooks. Um, one of the things that he wrote in um, 
uh, a notebook of his was how he desired to move beyond painting and try a number of different media, including um, uh, sculpture and ceramics and even pyrography, um, which is uh, the art of burning paper or wood. And um, he, uh, this, this desire um, uh, was, was accompanied by um, this kind of grand vision where he said, uh, it is in sculpture that I will make a truly phantasmagoric world of living monsters. Um, and of course, for those of you who are used to coming to the Nasher Sculpture Center, you get to regularly visit some of those um, wonderful living monsters in the Nasher collection. And of course, with this exhibition, we get to see um, more of that menagerie. Um, one of the reasons that Miro was, was ready to move away from painting was because you know, during this, um, this kind of tortured uh, migration throughout France, he was very deeply engaged in one of the most intensive periods of painting in his career, uh, where he painted um, these um, in, incredibly um, uh, worked, but very, very small um, uh, series of works called the Constellations. There are 21 um, uh, paintings of gouache and um, colored wash on, uh, on canvas, uh, but the canvases are only 18 by 15 inches. Um, so that you can see this amazing intensity uh, within each of these works. And after that kind of uh, intensity where he, he started painting this series um, in Paris in 1940 and worked on it for two years um, and finally finished it in, uh, when he returned to Barcelona in 1942. Um, so he was really um, ready to, to move away from this, this kind of incredibly uh, detailed and painstaking kind of painting into something that was much, much freer. Um, and he found that opportunity in uh, his old friend, uh, Josep Lorenz Artigas, who uh, was um, a fellow student in art school. Um, they had met initially in 1915 at the Francesc Galli School of Art and uh, had participated together in the Cercle Artistique Saint-Luc and also the Agrupacio Courbet, which um, during the teens in Barcelona were um, avant-garde um, uh, circles of artists. And then they were both in France um, at the same time in the 1920s. Um, Miro, of course, coming back to Spain um, in 1940, and Artigas returning in, to Barcelona in 1941. And it was an exhibition that Artigas had in Barcelona um, in 1942 at the Libreria Argos in Bar um, that, uh, uh, that Miro saw and um, realized he might have a, um, uh, someone who could assist him in moving away from painting. One of, the, one of his primary interests in ceramics was that he knew absolutely nothing about it. Um, Painting he saw as something that was cerebral um, and something that was really best done in the city. And uh, he, he longed to be in the country in a large studio where he could um, really kind of get his hands dirty. And uh, the idea of um, digging his hands into the earth uh, to make something, going back to those kind of very elemental, formative um, experiences that we have as a child of, of forming sculpture with mud or, or Play-Doh was, uh, was something that he, he felt was a way for him to kind of re-engage with his artistic creativity without any kind of mediating um, uh, uh, experience or, or concerns about technique. Um, I love this photo of Miro and Artigas. This is from um, about 1944-45, from their, their first um, uh, initial uh, foray together. And uh, the, the, the pot that uh, Miro is, um, is, is pretending to decorate with uh, glaze uh, is, um, is upstairs in the exhibition right now. Um, and it, it was a pot that Artigas made in 1941, and then when Miro uh, came to work with him, uh, he, he gave him several things to, to, um, to decorate. 
But uh, Miro, of course, looked at what Artigas was doing in a very different light. Um, the things that, uh, were, that didn't make it out of Artigas's kiln uh, were, were fodder for Miro. And so he very quickly um, started to take things off of the scrap heap and use them for his own devices. So here you see the, the pot in the photograph, which is upstairs in the exhibition. And this is, an, this is also in the exhibition as an example of, of the kind of thing that Miro saw as potential for art, where Artigas uh, uh, merely saw it as a, as a, as a failure, um, something that he pulled off the scrap heap and then decorated himself. And the initial um, uh, experimentation from 1944 to 46 also yielded a number of small ceramic sculptures uh, which you see arrayed here on the table, um, including uh, some initial versions of what would be one of Miro's grandest uh, sculptural undertakings, the, the monumental arch at the, the Mog Foundation um, from the 1960s. And we, we have a, a later rendering of a uh, model for that arch in the exhibition. We'll, we'll come to a photo of it later. But then there are also these wonderful little creatures uh, ceramic uh, creatures that populate that table as well. And you can see he's, he's beginning to uh, elaborate this, this, uh, this, this phantasmagoric world of living monsters that he initially thought of uh, back in the, in, the early, in the late 30s, early 40s. Um, in, it just so in the, in the photograph, uh, this is Artigas, this is Miro, and this is uh, Tini Matisse, um, Pierre Matisse's wife. And it was, this is, was taken in 1946, and it was the first time that, um, that uh, Miro had, any, had had any contact, um, direct contact with um, either of his dealers, either uh, Pierre Matisse in New York or uh, his dealers in France. Um, one of the things that uh, Miro was really interested in in working with ceramics is their natural connection to nature, their kind of inherent connection to nature. And he, he wrote about um, wanting to put sculptures outdoors in some kind of natural environment. And this is a photograph that was taken by the, the Catalan photographer Joaquin Gomis um, of a number of those initial uh, ceramic monsters that Miro and Artigas made um, just in the bushes in, uh, outside of uh, uh, Artigas's studio as if they're kind of emerging from the undergrowth, these little creatures. One of the uh, precursors to Miro's interest in, in ceramics uh, was his, um, his Catalan compatriot, the, the architect um, Antonio Gaudí. If, you know, growing up in, in uh, Barcelona and coming up as an art student at the time, Gaudí was also involved in many of, uh, in establishing some of those avant-garde artistic circles that Miro was involved in. And also having all of those incredible examples of Gaudí's architecture that are um, uh, all derived from natural forms and then encrusted in colorful ceramics, uh, ceramic mosaics. So here's a photograph of Miro and Tini Matisse um, on the roof of the Casa Batio uh, in, in Barcelona. And you can see um, the, the ceramic mosaics that decorate that roof. And here's a color photograph of, of what they would have seen there. Um, this, this beautiful ceramic mosaic on the facade, the ceramic tiles on the roof, and this incredible uh, zoomorphic form of the roof that looks like the spine and scales of a dragon. So that, that is the context from which Miro came when, when he was starting to engage in, in ceramics. Um, after 1946, there was a period in which uh, Miro uh, traveled extensively, re-engaged uh, with the art world, reconnected with um, his dealers and artist friends in uh, New York and throughout Europe. And then in 1952, he and Artigas, and now Artigas' uh, young son, Juan Gardi Artigas, uh, began to create uh, an enormous cache of works in fired clay. And during the period of uh, 1954 to 1956, they created over 230 uh, ceramics and ceramic sculptures, um, each one of them unique. 
But um, it was also at this point that uh, Artigas had um, moved his studio into uh, the country, into a mountain town called Galifa, and, and built this e enormous furnace to fire uh, uh, the clay. And that uh, really allowed them to, um, uh, to, to expand their, um, uh, the, the, the things that they could potentially make. Um, and it's interesting to note that when uh, Artigas tells the story that when Miro first visited um, uh, his, his new home and studio in Galifa, he was so moved by the landscape that he immediately start, started to paint on the rocks around uh, the house and the studio. And you, we see in Miro's, um, in Miro's work in ceramics a number of these kinds of um, painted rocks. Um, such as stone uh, here from the Art Institute of, Sh Art Institute of Chicago, which is up in, in, the ex in the galleries upstairs. And then also these, you know, what, what we would consider to be tiny, insignificant things by Miro, but that are really wonderful. These are, they look like painted stones, but um, these are ceramic um, sculptures that, um, um, and the notion that, um, you know, the, the idea of, coming upon a painted stone uh, registers with um, uh, uh, prehistoric monuments, recalls prehistoric monuments, um, but also this, this kind of um, surrealist sense of, uh, in, of um, punning with materials. Um, so he's, he's taken what is essentially ground stone and reconstituted it back into, uh, back into stone. Um, part of his engagement with uh, ceramics was to uh, question the, the, the kinds of traditions that, that, that come forth um, from that. Um, and so he created a series of works called Antiplates. Uh, and we have this example in the exhibition upstairs, which are um, essentially taking a, a utilitarian form and rendering it useless for its intended function, um, and essentially turning it into sculpture. Now, um, M M Miro uh, had really started thinking about this very early on. This is a photograph of an object that he had in his home in the 1930s. Um, and you can see that it's this kind of uh, wildly uh, decorated plate form, um, most likely made in plaster and then in, in good surrealist assemblage fashion encrusted with all kinds of things. Um, What's interesting to me about um, those anti-plates, and um, this is typical of Miro's work in general, is that he was always finding the transcendent in the most humble things around us, uh, the earth beneath our feet, the rocks, the, um, uh, the, the plants, and, uh, and the stars above. And there was this kind of universal uh, connection with both of those. And if you look, what, one of the things that fascinated me in, in researching um, Miro and ceramics uh, during this period at the, at the Miro Foundation in Barcelona was that there's this cache of, um, of uh, astrological uh, uh, sky charts um, that, uh, that Miro cut out of the newspaper and kept, um, you know, uh, hundreds of these things. And so it was interesting to think about uh, the kind of formal qualities of those, of those sky charts um, in connection to the antiplates, uh, where you essentially have, um, uh, you know, a drawing right here. We have a, on the left is a, a drawing, uh, a kind of a schematic sketch, an idea for an antiplate, and on the right is an image of one of the sky charts that that he kept. And so, you know, you you have this kind of uh, formal connection between, you know, the 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 thing that's made from the earth and that's the humble thing on our table with uh, the stars above our heads. Um, Miro's practice as a ceramist was one of um, total collaboration. Um, he worked um, uh, in conjunction with Artigas and Artigas' son to create um, works that are essentially assemblage sculptures. And you can see here from this photograph of the studio all of these various bits of ceramics that Miro would then combine in, in, in uh, all manner of, of fantastic and creative ways. So a few, a few examples in the exhibition are a sailboat, um, where you have this kind of 
um, pebble or, or, or stone form mounted onto uh, uh, this broken ceramic on a ceramic tile, and then another uh, decorated in broken ceramic that uh, resembles a sail. And then again, you know, this, this kind of uh, um, trunk form and uh, this um, bird on top. Um, and then the uh, ironing board, of course, um, upstairs, which um, I think cl connects very clearly Miro's practice in ceramics with Miro's practice in sculpture. Miro's sculptures, and certainly the ones that we know from uh, the late 1960s, the painted bronzes, are all assemblages, um, and mostly assemblages of objects that he found around his farm in Montreuil. Um, and the ironing board, in fact, makes an appearance in, in a number of works uh, by Miro. Um, so we, you have it in this, in this fantastic ceramic sculpture upstairs. And it's interesting you know, just to think about the, the shape of this base. Um, actually came from a very tiny little assemblage that he made back in the 30s um, and was photographed in, uh, um, in his home. Uh, you see this, this kind of empty spool of thread with a tiny little stone perched on top of it. And then, of course, that ironing board makes another appearance in, in uh, Miro's painted bronze, um, Caress of a Bird, which you see outside here in the Nasher collection. Um, the kind of vocabulary of forms Miro uh, was constantly drew from, and so a lot of the characters that he created um, appear over and over and over again. So here is one of those um, uh, little creatures that he made initially in 1945 that now has this um, kind of extended nose, two little nostrils right there, um, uh, a little uh, stone with a star uh, inscribed on it in its mouth, and then a sunbird, the uh, counterpart to moonbird, um, perched atop its, its nose. And Sunbird, again, makes an, an appearance in another work in the exhibition on, on this uh, pumpkin. And this kind of uh, bird face also appears in a number of his sculptures and ceramics. Um, in, 19, in the late 1950s, early 1960s, Miro was commissioned uh, to create a, um, uh, 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 an outdoor sculpture garden for his Parisian dealer, M.A. Mott. And uh, he he worked in collaboration uh, with, his, uh, with his friend, uh, the architect Sert uh, from Barcelona as well, uh, who was designing the building, um, and came up with what he called uh, the labyrinth, which is this kind of winding path behind uh, the, the foundation um, that is populated with this incredible menagerie of, of living monsters, uh, many of them in ceramics. And so this commission allowed them to attempt ceramics on the kind of grand scale that, that he had always um, hoped. This is a photograph of Miro and Artigas, and then Artigas's son, Juan Gardi, who um, was instrumental in, in creating many of the works of art from the uh, period in 1954 um, until uh, they stopped working together in 1970. Um, and so you see the scale of, of the ceramics really starts to um, uh, become uh, a, a challenge. Um, we have this uh, wonderful sculpture, Man and Woman, um, in the exhibition made in 1961. And then the works that were made for uh, the labyrinth at the Fondation Mag um, include um, this incredible six foot tall ceramic sculpture uh, called Goddess. Um, and again, you see uh, the, the tortoise shell, Miro's. Um, sculptural symbol for fertility um, on goddess, uh, at, and, and you'll see it again in 1967 on uh, the front of Caress of a Bird outside as well. Um, but you know, these, these ceramics are so massive that they're assemblages as well. They had to be um, fired in separate parts and put together, and you can see on the work upstairs in the middle of the entranceway that the horn and the two wings are attached. Um, uh, had, had been fired separately and attached. And in fact, this is a photograph from um, uh, Galifa and um, uh, Artigas's studio of many of the works destined for the labyrinth um, uh, before they were shipped. And you can see that one of these, this is um, the lizard, which is now crawling up the side of, of uh, 
uh, Sert's building, um, and the various appendages that have yet to be um, um, attached. And here you have a, a, a sense of, of what this, um, uh, what this um, wholly conceived work of art is like with these um, kind of ceramic tile murals, um, these roundels on the side of the tower, um, and um, the goddess um, being given pride of placement in, in the middle of the first level of the, of the, um, of the labyrinth. And then here's the, the lizard crawling up the wall. Um, it's really extraordinary, um, I think, that we actually have goddess sitting in the middle of our entrance bay right now, because essentially this is a site-specific work of art, and it's never been loaned before. So, um, you know, see it here, and then you'll have to, you'll have to go to Saint Paul de Vence and the Mock Foundation to see it again. So this is, um, you, this may look familiar from the photograph um, from 1946 of all of those little creatures. Um, Miro and Artigas made about eight different versions of this arch figure. Um, in, in preparation for creating the monumental arch for the, um, uh, the, the labyrinth at, at the Fondation Macht. And here you see a photograph of the, the final um, uh, monumental version of it, which was um, made in concrete. And uh, Miro had wanted to do a work in concrete since 1937 when he saw Picasso sculptures uh, in concrete at the uh, Spanish pavilion uh, at the Paris World's Fair. But again, you see you know, this kind of menagerie of creatures. There's the arch figure. We saw a goddess. And here's a marble version of, um, of Sunbird. Um, I think, again, the, the example of, of uh, um, Antoni Gaudi was central in, in Miro's mind when he was creating uh, the, the labyrinth for the Fondation Mach. Um, you, you have the kind of um, uh, zoomorphic um, uh, uh, transformations that were typical of Gaudi in uh, the labyrinth at the, at the Mach Foundation. And here, you know, uh, I'm sure that Park Guell in, in, in Barcelona must have been on Miro's mind when he was um, creating the, the labyrinth. Um, you have all of these... Uh, uh, kind of meandering serpentine uh, benches that are, are decorated in these wonderful ceramic mosaics. And the kind of the way that the architecture of the park is incorporated into the cliffs and, and mimics nature as well. Um, for, for Miro, um, turning to ceramics was a way to um, reground himself and, and, and get back to the essentials of art making. Um, the, the fact that he was um, able to rely on um, his dear friend and, and, uh, and the, the son of his dear friend um, as collaborators um, made it all the better. But it, it allowed him to, um, to, ceramics were for him, um, I think, um, offered the, the essence of, um, of making this kind of uh, transformative connection between uh, the humble things around us, the earth under our feet, and uh, the stars above. So, thank you. <laughs>